This is the Biblical Mind Podcast, produced by the Center for Hebraic Thought. Honest five-star reviews help others find this podcast. Visit the magazine at thebiblicalmind.org for articles and videos that explore the deep structures of Scripture. For many Christians, um, there is a sense of, of what we call supersessionism, meaning that uh, the belief that when Jesus came and after he died and was resurrected and ascended, that all of the things from Judaism and from the Old Testament kind of just just ceased. They just kind of wiped away. And one of those is the Sabbath, um, which is which is a bit ironic because it being you know one of the Ten Commandments and there from the beginning and certainly integral to to you know the pentateuch of the first five books of the bible but but it is one of these things and i think probably christians misunderstand it because in the new testament we're so we so often see jesus in these confrontations with the pharisees and the pharisees are the bad guys the legalists and jesus has come to um, give us freedom and love and free from all those rules and so i think the sabbath got tied up in that notion of uh, kind of the misunderstanding that God's law was somehow bad and Jesus came to make things good. And so we as Christians don't need that law anymore. Kind of a misreading of Paul and a misreading certainly of the Old Testament. And so I think the sad thing is, is that I've found that most Christians that I encounter um, have no kind of understanding of the Sabbath, certainly of what it meant in the Old Testament and what it meant to um, God's people, but then also have really no understanding about what it means to, uh, in the New Testament, this new age of the Spirit in Christ's risen age, uh, and how we can still delight in that rest. And I think maybe more than ever in our technological age, we are certainly 100% of people who are desperately in need of that rest and finding those moments of kind of sanctifying holy time in our lives. Um, and I think that's a sad thing. I think that's what, that's what Christians generally miss or generally misunderstand about what the Sabbath actually is. So there are a lot of layers in what you just said. Um, one of them would be just how important the Sabbath is in both the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and, uh, and the New Testament. Um, when I was researching for a book on ritual, I, I was actually shocked to find out how often the either the uh, the neglect of the Sabbath or the practice of the Sabbath is mentioned by the prophets. Uh, you know, when they're excoriating Israel for their evils, you know, like they don't, they don't do the Sabbaths, right? Or, mm. or the eunuch in Isaiah who, um, who, who will be joined, uh, to God's people, the one who keeps the Sabbath at mm. least, uh, will be. Um, so why do you think it is so central? Uh, we'll just start with Israel and we'll just assume that whatever's true of Israel is in some way true of, uh, of us as well. Mm. Uh, why, what is so important about the Sabbath for Israel, for ancient Israel? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, um, and I, I trace some of this out in the book, but I think the main thing for me, um, you know, and it, it, there's all sorts of debates as when, when what was written and, and, and who wrote it and all that kind of stuff. So we won't get into that, but, um, but the Sabbath, uh, you know, I mean, one of the first things we see about the Sabbath is obviously it's in Genesis chapter one. I mean, it, you can't get any more in your face in terms of the biblical text than opening a book and reading it in the first chapter. This is what God did. <clears throat> rested on the seventh day, he blessed, uh, blessed the Sabbath day and or the seventh day, and then consecrated it or made it holy. Um, so this is fascinating thing about holy time. But then, then you get into um, this wonderful uh, and and beautiful kind of weaving in of the Sabbath. Uh, this is what I love about the Old Testament and the biblical authors is they take these <clears throat> they take these ancient historical stories and in this case the story of the manna in the wilderness. And so here you have Israel, you know, the the Hebrew slaves have been delivered from Egypt and they're wandering out through the Sinai Peninsula. They're about to die, basically, and they complain of having no water. God provides water, and then they complain of having no food, and God provides the manna. Now, that <clears throat> in and of itself is, is you know, 
I mean, that's a that's a pretty handy miracle as far as I'm concerned, you know, that, that God can feed, you know, that many hundreds of thousands or how many ever came out of Egypt. Um, but the the double kind of teaching, and this is where the uh, I think the ancient writers were so clever, um, is that then you have this whole added layer on that story as not God just providing for his people in this wilderness wandering but that he will consistently provide every week uh, double the amount on the sixth day so that all of the Israelites can rest with their families and celebrate on the seventh day. And so you have in that manna story, this this, this wonderful um, wrapping and interweaving of themes of, of trust and of obedience. And at this point in the Bible, and at this point in Exodus, Israel hasn't been given the law at Sinai. They haven't received the covenant law. And so we see, um, you know, one of the images and one of the motifs in Exodus, when, <clears throat> when Israel comes out of Egypt, you have, you know, kind of all of these symbols of blood and water and everything uh, really uh, kind of alluding to uh, birth and new life. And so Israel is literally birthed out of the, uh, out of the depths of the, the Reed Sea as they come up and uh, God uses the phrase, Israel is my firstborn son. And, right. so, and so, so you have this wonderful, um, you know, this wonderful father son or father child image in the wilderness wanderings that I think so many people lose and and sometimes christians lose because i think they have you know maybe this kind of you know uh, kind of distorted perception of god as as kind of the law giver as if he's you know kind of just the judge sitting up in heaven you know waiting to kind of smack down on his people when they disobey and <clears throat> but in this instance you see uh, and this and this comes into your um, kind of your some of the things that you've written on on ritual, but here you see that the way God teaches His people to understand who He is and who they are as His beloved children is through this ritual practice of Him providing, of them trusting, and of them ceasing on the seventh day. And so you get this sense of God's. You know, God the Father kind of teaching and training, as it were, raising his son in the wilderness uh, in this, you know, in, just in this beautiful way and, and, and teaching his son, okay, this, this is how you live. You know, this is, this is the rhythm that I have set into the foundation of creation, of all creation. And now I want you as a people to follow that. Follow me into that seventh day of holy rest. And, and that, that, I mean, that to me is, you know, I mean, that's just the, you know, that's the tip of the iceberg. But I think that to me kind of begins, you know, this long journey of how the Sabbath and, you know, and there are also big chunks of the section. I mean, basically all the histories, you know, from basically from Joshua to two kings, you know, we almost hear nothing of the Sabbath. It's really not until Nehemiah again, who um, Nehemiah right. gets really, you know, gets really, really freaked out about, <laughs> about Sabbath right. practice. <laughs> but um, walking but, the gates of the city on the yeah, Sabbath. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, you know, you get these kind of Monty Python images of him throwing like, you know, gourds and pumpkins right. on people's heads you know for not <laughs> for right. disobeying the sabbath right. but but i think that's the um you know so I, I think at its core i mean obviously it comes into place you know in the commandments it will come into place in sinai in the commandments but i think this is one of the beautiful things that i kind of discovered as i was studying this um about the sabbath <clears throat> is that it's really not and, and and just as you mentioned in Isaiah, the the eunuchs and kind of these foreigners joining themselves to the Lord through Sabbath obedience, it's really the Sabbath is this gift for not just for Israel, but it's actually for the whole of humanity. Because really, the way the ancient biblical authors saw it was that <clears throat> this was a rhythm that was a gift for Israel, but it was also a gift for for all nations. You know that this is goes back to the very the very beginnings of creation, you know, and, and that I think is, is to me, I mean, and the very few things, you know, that, that kind of do go back to Genesis one in the sense of consistently coming up in the script, right. in the scriptures, you know? So I think that's, that's one of the the kind of main things in terms of, you know, for me that the, the, the Sabbath is, is ultimately, you know, God's gift to his people in teaching them 
kind of the rhythm that he desires and the rhythm the rhythm that is that is to lead us into kind of our human flourishing for lack of a better word everybody yeah. uses the word flourishing i know but i always <laughs> refer to synonym, but, but it, really it really is one of the best metaphors out there so. it really is isn't it i know I, I, I keep catching myself saying it but i'm like oh but it's a good word <laughs> <laughs> i actually asked jonathan pennington who's one of our fellows because he has a book called yes. Sermon on the mountain human flourish and i was like are there any synonyms he's like no i've, yeah. I've looked but i can't find them so <laughs> mail your synonyms into uh Center for Hebraic Thought, all of you that you find one. Um, I hadn't thought about it until I read this book uh, that's called Sabbath Rest, The Beauty of God's Rhythm for a Digital Age that you wrote. Um, I had not thought of the manna episode that way. Mm. Um, it was striking to me. Um, and and honestly, uh, what that little insight does, it opens, it's like a key that opens several doors, um, is you also realize, oh yeah, God was providing, but they had to go out and work for this. Yeah. And um, they were even relieved from their provision, the provision work uh, uh, on that one day. And then that was going to be like um, working, trusting God on the seventh day when they entered the land and, and were actually working fields, right? Mm. Trying to get to grow. I think it's hard for us to appreciate, I, I've had to read quite a bit on agrarian subsistence farming in the ancient world, yep. <laughs> um, trying to understand the Iron Age Israelites situation. But you realize the temptation really is uh, to work seven days a week, right? Yeah. Just to, to, to manage your crops and your flocks very carefully so you lose nothing because you don't want to starve to death. That's, yeah. uh, and um, I, I don't know what shocks Christians more in some ways when you talk about Sabbath, that the fact that you really, God, it seems like really God does want us to rest one day a, a week as part of his plan for humanity or that he wants us to work six days a week. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and that's right. That, like the French, the French three day week is not the way that it's not God's way. And maybe exactly. even the American five day week is, is not God's way. Um, now I, I think that. that has to be improvised in some way. But. I love that. I was teaching, I was teaching on this one time at a church and it was the first time someone had asked that they said, you know, it's really great that you're telling us um, that we should take it, you know, have a, have a day of rest one day a week. But actually, I really need two days a week for my weekend. <laughs> and I started laughing, and he said, "And he said, does that mean like I'm sinning against God?" And I was like, "No, it doesn't mean you're sinning." And I said, "Look, I said you you got to understand. I mean, and I think this is the funny thing. I think once you once you start getting really deep into Sabbath and you start talking about rest, um, <laughs> excuse me, you can forget that um, that actually God, you know, God still wants us to be blessed and refreshed and whole for our six days of work. So like I, right. I try to, I try to tell people that like, you know, look, what I'm not, what I'm not kind of promoting is a, you know, go work in Manhattan, you know, blitz, you know, your, you know, work for some big hedge fund, you know, blitz your mind to its max, you know, 20 hours a day. And then, you know, if for six days and then, you know, and then on the seventh day, take a rest, you know, that that's not it at all. I mean, I think this is one of the things that I've found so fascinating when I, kind of got in, you know, maybe about kind of five years ago or something like that. Um, when I really committed myself to to practicing Sabbath and to keeping a Sabbath, <clears throat> one of the things that I found was that actually you can you can pretty easily sustain a six day working week right. if you're incorporating all of these kind of all of the gifts that come with Sabbath in the sense of, you know, you you rest, you're refreshed, you know, you, you let your mind go from all of, you know, your things, you, you know, your work, what you do in the world. And, um, you know, and then you come back to your work really refreshed. And so you bring yeah. that sense of rest into your work, but you realize that, you know, once you get into your work, you start to, at least for me, I, I really started to begin to see the unhealthy patterns that I had in my own working. So it was, it was, you know, I, I needed to figure out what my what my boundaries were in work, and and that was actually a direct result of you know of my learning to practice the Sabbath. And and the other the other part of that, which I really had to learn, <clears throat> which was maybe one of the biggest things. Um, when I first started this, um, you know, and, and really kind of just was convicted in, in my studies and, and, and wanted to begin practicing the Sabbath, um, you know, one of the first things, I mean, I, I swear to you, Drew, I, I mean, I haven't 
I haven't been a drug addict, but if I had been a heroin addict, I think mm. giving up my phone and my screens for one 24 hour period a right. week was, was pretty much, I felt like a heroin addict coming off of drugs. I mean, I can't yeah. even tell you like the thing sitting next to me on the, you know, on the bed stand or on the table next to the, you know, next to the couch. I mean, it was just this constant, I mean, it was, I, I had to get to a point where I would like put it in a drawer so I couldn't see my phone. And then that would kind of help me out. <laughs> Actually, I do this digital challenge with my students where I challenge them not to look at a screen or text or anything for a week. Oh, you know, most of them, I, they have to go 24 hours, but some of them go the full week. And um, I have them chronicle it in a journal. And uh, one of the shocking things to me when I first did this last year was um, you read their journals, like their day by day journaling, and you would have sworn they were coming off drugs. Yeah. Uh, I like they were <laughs> the full range of emotions that peaked in like day three. Um, <laughs> exactly. and, you know, by day seven, they calm down, they can kind of see things more clearly. But there, I mean, there were some that were like openly angry at me. For, yeah. Why did you ask me to do this? <laughs> My, I realize everything's wrong. My, uh, it's it's amazing what that little black square has uh, uh, done for uh, yeah for us and how it's and how you talk about in the book how it's 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 not an accident it's it's actually designed to yeah. do that yeah exactly yeah. exactly yeah um, so many things to unpack uh, with Sabbath I mean I know it, it's funny because so many Christians don't practice it um, I think part of that too is the the social structures that used to uh, kind of in um, foster Sabbath keeping. Uh, and we think of Sabbath here as a Sunday uh, ritual uh, in America, mm. but you know, you know, it used to be, as they say, you know, there was church on Sunday, there were no little league games scheduled or, you know, there was basically uh, you, the stores were closed, you know, yeah. you could only buy, buy bread and milk and that kind of thing. Um, living in Jerusalem. Have you ever lived in Israel? I haven't lived there, been there, but I haven't lived You've there. You've been yet. there on a Sabbath. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. You know, especially I lived in Jerusalem for a semester and, um, and it was great, especially with kids is on, on Shabbat, yeah. you could like walk down all the streets in the middle of the streets. Cause there are no cars. There's no one know. there. I know. Yeah. Um, and you know, and their stores are all closed. You know, they usually have a, a non-Jew working in a convenience store. So if you need something emergency, you you can get it. But, um, you, you like it's, you feel Sabbath, right? And mm -hmm. I think you talk to people, baby boomers, especially they remember what it feels like to kind of have the Sunday version of Sabbath. Um, and I think now what you're asking us to do when you suggest Sabbath in, in, in the book the way you do, which I think is spot on, you're actually asking us to be freakish and weird in some way, I think. <laughs> is, is that right? <laughs> to be freakish and weird? Yeah, <laughs> to be the weird one. And this is what a lot of my Orthodox Jewish friends say is they like, like yeah. one thing we know is we know how to be weird in a society. Like we know that we're the oddballs. We look different. We eat different. We act different, you know. And that Christians don't really have that sensibility anymore. Yeah, no, and and I think that's exactly it. I mean, I think that's that's part of the, yeah, I think that's part of being, you know, being in the world, but being, you know, being a witness to the world. And you know, I think that's where, you know, that's where Sabbath to me becomes such a, um, you know, such a powerful witness in terms of, you know, and and not just on a, um, you know, by no means just on a personal level. That's the other thing about the Sabbath is once you start digging into it and you start unpacking it and getting into those layers, you realize, especially by the time you get to the book of Leviticus, you realize that it's not just a question of, of my personal refreshment, mm -hmm. but that in fact, actually it's, it's God's prescription for, you know, rest and refreshment for the entirety of creation, you know, that, 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 you know, you can't work your animals on that day. And, right, you know, right. you can't, you know, you have the, the fields have to lie fallow for, you know, on, on the Sabbath year and on the Sabbath day, um, you know, all of these things that we do, you know, in the work of our lives kind of keep us busy and do all these things, you know, God is just, you know, I mean, you know, literally with a megaphone saying stop, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's like, you know, th there's not many biblical commands, you know, apart from like, you know, don't, don't worship idols, you know, and Deuteronomy right. and things like that, or smash down all the other, you know, there aren't many, you know, kind of commands that are just so much like God has a bullhorn and it's just screaming and saying, just cease, 
you know, yeah. do do what I do. I'm God. I didn't need to stop on the seventh day. I could have kept going, but I did. Exactly. I I stopped for your sake. Right. Um, and so you know, so it is it is one of these things. And and like I think I think when I've been so shocked about it in, in kind of you know in writing the book and then also in just chatting with people. Um, you know, and then, and then, I mean, even on top of that, there's the whole kind of social justice element in terms of, you know, your slaves resting the people who work for you, all of that kind of stuff as well. But, um, but I think what I've been shocked about is, um, is sometimes the response. I mean, this has been, you know, from my students, I, I teach at a, a theological seminary in London and even some of the responses from my students, I've had students come up to me after, you know, after lectures and say, you know, that, and, and these are, these are good you know, God fearing Christians, I hope. Um, and they said, you know, you know, I, I think I really, I really love the idea of Sabbath. I love the idea of rest. Um, but, um, but I, I just can't do it. You know, my life is too crazy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love, I love coming back with the response of, of, Yes, because that's exactly why you need to be taking a Sabbath. <laughs> and then the, that I remember one woman saying, like, you know, well, who's going to do this? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do this? And who's going to do all these things? And I said, look, I, I don't have the answers to how, to how to sort your life out. That's what I'm not here to do. I'm here to teach you theology and the Bible. And um, and I said, I said, look, you know, I'm just telling you what God commands you to do. Like I'm not telling you anything else. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. You know, this is this is not rocket science here. This is like the Ten Commandments. You know, this is the uh, yeah. this is the fourth commandment. You know, we're we're I'm even laughing because I've had this conversation so many we're, times. We're in top five yeah. territory here in terms of the Ten Commandments. You know, and that just blows my mind that people have like the nerve to say, "Well, oh, yeah. know, it's great that God says love your neighbor, but you know what? I'm just too busy. I can't do that." You know, and you just think, "Wow, that's we've got to talk about what it means to follow Jesus." Jesus. Um, but it's, um, so it is one of those things that, that, uh, but, but that, you know, but I think to me too, and I think, and I think you probably agree that is just so symptomatic of our society and, and just where we've come to in terms of, and I think part of that, and talk about this in the book a little bit, but part of that is, is kind of the digital revolution that we've, you know, experienced over the last, you know, whatever, mm-hmm. 20, 30 years or something like that. But really, I mean, really probably since the advent of the, uh, of the smartphone. And, um, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, if nothing else, I mean, what I try to talk to people about is just, you know, and, and, and I believe me, I've been like battling with clergy who tell me that like, they're never mm-hmm. supposed to take a Sabbath. <laughs> I'm like, right, right, I'm like yeah. no wonder you're burning out. Um, but anyway, but I, I, you know, I just, I just say to people, look, you know, you, you might not believe me, like, that's fine. You know, we can argue the biblical texts and we can argue about how Jesus teaches the Sabbath. Um, you know, all I'm telling you is that <clears throat> it seems pretty plain to me in scripture that this is what God has commanded us from the beginning of creation and that it's been integral to his people's life. And I don't think that stops with Jesus. <clears throat> I think it's something that continues today because I think the Sabbath is a gift. And then usually I end by saying, you know, just just do me, you know, just humor me and go and for a month, <clears throat> take four weeks and take a Sabbath each week and, and literally do no work on that day and, you know, worship God, do whatever you can. And, um, and tell me if, the, if it was a good thing or a bad thing, mm. you know, and, and, and I don't know anybody who's ever come back to me after actually doing that and saying, yeah, you know what? That was just a waste of time. We can blame the phone, but I, I think we also have to blame, you know, the church's insistence, that, you know, in, in the West, that basically the soul is the site of all God's operations. Mm, yes, uh, and that you know, there, there's no way to do Sabbath just in your soul, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Can I can I just like take 20 minutes and in my mind personally expand that out to <laughs> personally four hours? <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so in my, it was like I was Sabbathing for 20. It was like, no, you actually have to put your body into the practice for yeah. 24 hours or how, you know, the, the full day. Yeah. Um, and there's no way around it. Like, uh, and, and of course, so much of discipleship and, and life together is, is exactly that. And so Sabbath is an easy way to kind of chip away at that soul centeredness yeah. of, of some versions of Christianity. Yeah. Um, and that let me just one one last point on that because I think that's so that's so important and that was the other thing that um that the other kind of pushback I would get on the Sabbath when teaching on this was that the other the other side and this is such a kind of common uh, kind of Christian 
tact in terms of biblical exegesis understanding is is to say is to just is to spiritualize something by the time you get right. into the new testament and a person came up to me and said you know i experience sabbath rest all the time you know like because you know jesus has poured out his spirit and you know we now live in his rest and he says mm-hmm. come to me all who you know labor and i said yes i said you are exactly right i was like your spirit your soul is communing with christ and if you are in that communion like saint Teresa of Avila, and you've gone into you know into the the innermost part of the castle. Yeah. You are experiencing that rest, but you also have a physical body, and your body cannot sustain not resting. And yeah. and and this is and this is the thing I think to me, and this is partially because I'm doing some studies in Leviticus right now, but just and this kind of ties into your some of the work that you've done on ritual. But part of it is just the the you know, kind of the light bulb moment of, of realizing that embodied ritual, that we are physical human beings. And I think, you know, I mean, all the interesting stuff, like all the fascinating stuff that's coming out in neuroscience, that coming out about studies about how we eat our microbiome, you know, how our gut oh, yeah. affects our minds and our emotions and all of these things, how they're so kind of, you know, amazingly tied together. Um, you know, we just tend to, I, I mean, I think there is this thing in Christianity today that, that is just, just spiritualize everything. <laughs> I heard, a, I heard a great term. Uh, well, I, can't, I can't remember who, who told this to me. He said, he said, you know, what we have in Christianity t- today is, is this kind of neo-gnostic angelism. Yeah, <laughs> and I loved it. Exactly you know, functional just, Marxianism with neo-gnosticism. Yeah. yeah, it's exactly it. And it's this idea that, well, like our bodies are just going to die and we're going to become angels. And I'm like, no, you're right. not going to become an angel. You're going to have a resurrected body, like a physical yeah. resurrected body. So yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think that I think that physic the physical side of it and the physical side of ritual is so is so critical um, to just who we are as human beings. And I think I think oftentimes that's maybe another maybe another one of the reasons why Sabbath kind of falls out of the Christian uh, radar is because yeah. people can just spiritualize it and say, well, you know what, I, I have Sabbath all the time. I don't need to take a day of rest. I'm fine. Uh, one of my favorite lines from the Gospel of Luke is, you know, and they thought he was a ghost, and he said. Give me some of that broiled fish, yeah. and he ate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, resurrection is real, folks. Exactly. Um, you can eat. I uh, know. I know. Um, so I have a couple questions. Uh, actually, I have a, a thousand questions. I'll pare them down to two issues <laughs> uh, before we run out of time here. Um, one is um, uh, one of our other, other fellows for the Center for Hebraic Thought, uh, Joshua Berman, has he loves to point out um, that the Sabbath that the seven day week is the only artifice in the calendar. So if you look in the ancient world and, and modern as well, like the year is tied to our, our uh, revolution around the sun. The month is tied to the moons, but there is no like seven day period anywhere in nature. So mm-hmm. it's a completely artificial construct um, by God for us. Um, so I, I do wonder, and this is a question that comes up, especially if you know any messianic Jews or if you have any Jewish friends, mm. Do you have any thoughts on the idea of the eternal Sabbath? Meaning, uh, uh, do you know this concept? I, I don't know in Judaism, but I but keep going. Uh, so that the idea that there really is like the the Sabbath that happened in creation sets the date, and and that there there's an actual like there's a metaphysical connection to every single Sabbath with creation, and so that's uh, yeah. that, that's what makes each Sabbath so important. Yeah, um, yeah, and which also means you can't. Like Sunday can't be your Sabbath and Tuesday can't be your Sabbath. That oh, is, I see. Yeah. But it's actually Shabbat is Shabbat is Shabbat and that's it. Yeah. Have, yeah. Have you ever heard this idea? No. Well, I've heard of it in, um, <clears throat> in seventh day Adventism. I, I didn't yeah, hear oh, of it. Yeah. yeah. I didn't hear of it. I, I haven't heard of it as called the, the eternal Sabbath, but, but yeah, but I think, <clears throat> I mean, I think that's a fascinating thing, uh, you know, to me. Ah, yeah, it is, it is a tough one to me. If you get to the practice of you know, the actual nuts and bolts, how do you practice Sabbath? Right? Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And I think, I think to me, you know, I think for the Christian, the most natural day <clears throat> to have a Sabbath is Sunday, because you know, if you you think about the practice of Sabbath in Judaism, you know, it was going to well, at least for the males and. It was going to the synagogue, you know, on Saturday morning, um, you know, having dinner uh, together with family or friends on a Friday evening. 
Um, and then, but, you know, so to me, it makes sense in, you know, in the Christian and, and there's all sorts of history behind the history of the church and, and how Sabbath became Sabbath in the Christian church or the Lord's day, uh, Sunday was called and things of that nature. Um, I mean, there is that, you know, the person who, who really got me first kind of fascinated by the whole s- subject was, um, was when I picked up and it was a long time ago when I picked up Abraham Heschel's, um, oh, yeah. his Sabbath book. And, and, you know, I mean, you know, I couldn't, I just remember not being able to put that book down. And I remember thinking to myself, if this guy just threw in the word Jesus a few times, I would have thought he was an evangelical <laughs> Christian, <laughs> but it was just yeah. such a profound book. And, um, and so, so I don't think, I mean, this is just, you know, I might be totally wrong, but this is my opinion. I don't think that the Sabbath has to be i think it's it's better if it is celebrated together because there's there's part of the book that um that i really want to press the idea of of the communal nature of sabbath that sabbath isn't just about our you know in our narcissistic individual world um it's not just about my personal rest it's actually about resting within family within the community and then also as as you know as jesus shows it's resting that can also bring you know wholeness and healing to people you know, and, and, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's the healing of diseases or, or whatever it is, you know, I think this is what Jesus' witness is, his witness to the Pharisees is about the Sabbath, that it's not merely, it's not merely, I guess, following the, the kind of litigious nature of what you can and cannot do or what constitutes work as much as it is the kind of positive side of it of of you know this movement towards wholeness this movement mm-hmm. towards you know god's rest his you know his shalom his you know his peace in the universe of bringing all these things together and so so yeah so i don't i don't hold to kind of the eternal sabbath i mean there is a fascinating kind of theological idea of you know god and i think heschel brings this up in his book about god consecrating you know, this day in eternity, you know, I mean, kind Mm -hmm. of in, in eternal time. And then, and so, so the Sabbath in some ways is always consecrated. um, And then we re-consecrate it every time we, you know, because God commands mm. us then to command, you know, to to keep the Sabbath or obey it. Um, <clears throat> so, but, like in a Eucharist, uh, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So for me, I think I think what's more important because uh, the fascinating thing in, in this whole journey was have been talking to people about Sabbath is is talking to shift workers, um, people mm. who are police, doctors, nurses. You know, when do they take Sabbath? You know, are they not allowed to take Sabbath because they, you know, they have to work on these, uh, you know, these these shift rotas? And um, and so you know, it got me thinking. About about that and i thought you know if the sabbath is a gift you know then then surely the lord's got to allow for some flexibility so i, I suppose my answer would be <clears throat> that that the best day to celebrate sabbath is when we celebrate it together and mm-hmm. you know so for christians you know on the on the on a sunday Saturday night and sunday um you know for the jew on on a friday and and a saturday um and that is kind of the optimal Sabbath celebration, as it were. <clears throat> but for many people, you know, they don't have that flexibility and they don't have that ability to, um, you know, to dictate their schedule in that way. Now, some people maybe can and maybe maybe it's part of changing their lifestyle or their life or whatever it is. Um, but like for me, for example, so I'm also a vicar or a, a priest at a, at a local Anglican church uh, here in Cambridge. And, um, you know, and, and I celebrate on a Sunday. But, you know, but having to prepare a sermon, it's still a lot of work. It doesn't feel like a a day of rest. And so so what I've basically incorporated into my life and our kind of family rhythm is that we kind of follow the tradition, traditional Jewish timing of the Sabbath, um, you know, from Mm -hmm. Friday evening to Saturday evening, because that, you know, because other than my working at the college for five, you know, Monday to Friday, that's kind of the one day I can really rest. And so. So yeah, so I think I think I'm not so um, I'm not so bothered about. I think it's the it's best if we can celebrate it together. Um, also because of the witness of what that you know kind of testifies to, um, as you know kind of a communal communal witness uh, together and the witness of the church uh, on a Sunday. Um, one of the great things, the great traditions in this country is the ringing of the church bells on Sunday, mm-hmm. and there is something that is in Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. exactly. On there, yeah. <laughs> and so you know, coming you know, kind of riding my bike down to church in Cambridge in the morning, and there's invariably like all these bells going off everywhere. 
um, it does remind you that there is, you know, kind of a proclamation that this is the Lord's day. This is the day of rest. This is the day of celebration, uh, day of resurrection. Um, so yeah, so I don't think I'm, I'm not overly bothered by people, you know, cause I realize we do live in a strange world. We're not ancient Israelites. We're not an agrarian people. Um, you know, we don't have, uh, necessarily the same flexibility uh, or the, the same kind of rhythm of life. So, so I think, I think what's more critical to me is that people, you know, find that 24 hour period in their weeks and as much as possible, try to create a weekly rhythm if they can. And I, I, I was just listening to an interview with um, a neuro uh, a neurologist who was talking about sleep, the importance of sleep, and one of the things mm-hmm. that sleep does for memory. And I've been reading on memory theory lately because this is really big in biblical studies now. Yeah. Um, and that that sleep, you know, one of the things sleep does is it it, it makes us forget things, the, the things that we don't need to hang on to, right? Yeah. And it actually collates our memories. And basically does a big flush if good sleep does. It flushes out all the stuff that we don't need and then kind of doubles down on the stuff that we do need to remember for the day mm. uh, and for the next day. Uh, and so, and in that way, it's it, sleep actually is constructing our memory in, in some ways. And I, I wonder if help, you know, maybe the pendulum swing here needs to be for people in the West who really aren't, most of us are not working slave away jobs, right? Yeah. Uh, um, that the pendulum swing needs to be for us thinking more of that. This is, this is actually God trying to construct us into a certain type of people. Mm. Um, and I wonder if there's, you know, cause with all rituals in the Bible, people want to, they want to ask the question, well, what's the point? I, I guess if you were to like thumbnail or, you know, just shoot from the hip here, <laughs> uh, to use a gun analogy, cause we're Americans, um, <laughs> the, uh, what do you think it's constructing? Like, how is it constructing our view of ourselves, our understanding of ourselves, like, and specifically, like what, you know, in other words, what do I learn from Sabbath? Even if you want to say, you know, something that happens over time. Uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes, it was a tweet from um, Wesley Hill who said, you know, in a, in a period of deep depression, going to church on any given Sunday didn't help, but going to church every Sunday did. Yeah. Um, and so I wonder what you see as things that we learn uh, from Sabbath specifically. Yeah. I mean, I, I can more probably give you just personal testimony yeah. in terms of what what I've learned. I mean, I think <clears throat> one of the things, and 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 believe me, by no means am I a Sabbath expert. I, I you know, I still fail miserably on trying to keep my holy day holy and to be obedient to the Lord's command. But um, but I think a couple of things. Uh, you know, you just mentioned uh, about memories. Um, and 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 likewise, I had listened to a podcast or something about neuroscien- neuroscientists, and, and one of the analogies he used about sleep was that it's like cleaning the desktop of our brains. I thought that was mm. such a great analogy. It's yeah, like when you clean, yeah. you know, you clean up your desktop at the end of the day, and he's like, that's basically what sleep is helping us organize our thoughts. And in some ways, I think the Sabbath is is a similar kind of idea and a similar kind of rest because what I've found is that when I unplug myself from the world of my working day and my working week, um, it gives me the space. And I, also a big part of my Sabbath is just getting outside, getting in creation. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we sit in front of computers all the time. I mean, at least in our jobs. Um, and so, so just getting out for me, it's on my bicycle. I just go out and I cycle out in the countryside and just, just breathe and, 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 you know, and just get refreshed. And, and I think that is, what I've found over the years is that day of not the lack of concern for work and the stress of work bearing kind of down on my shoulders is the moment that it's it's almost like the veil comes off and I can mm-hmm. all of a sudden see things a bit more clearly. I can process things um, with a bit more clarity. Um, so what's gone on in the week? Sometimes, you know, my bike rides are just, are just thinking about things, maybe things that bothered me or things that upset me or things that were good or whatever it might be. Um, but I think that that deliberate and intentional we'll call it a consecration of time of, of making mm-hmm. time holy um, allows us to see things in a different kind of in a different light. And so, and so like your analogy of sleep, I think the Sabbath also kind of 
restructures or helps restructure our memory as we process kind of things that have gone on. And I think that's a wonderful thing about the Sabbath. Uh, the other thing, um, you know, and, and I've kind of gone through all sorts of varieties of experiments and when my when I've ruined Sabbaths and really kind of not had a good holy day, when I've had mm-hmm. good good days. And one of the things I learned early on, um, <clears throat> because I thought, oh, this will be such a great day. I mean, <clears throat> you probably know this sentiment because you and I are in the same trade as it were, but it's um I thought, oh, this is gonna be so great. I've got a day of rest. I can catch up on all the reading that I haven't done this week. <laughs> And so, you know, of yes, course, I, I, I have committed this fallacy. <laughs> I, picked, I picked up the latest, you know, and then it's so funny because I think after a couple of weeks, I, I tried this and and I realized I was like, oh, no, you know, this is this is work for me. I mean, this is, mm-hmm. you know, it seems strange, but reading books for us is is part of our work, actually. Right. And so, so all of my Sabbaths now, I never pick up a theological book, um, won't touch anything. You know, I'll read, I'll read other books, but I will right. not kind of read a theology book because it just draws me back to work. And the last thing, let, let, let me just share the last thing. I think th- this is the, this is the, the, the component of Sabbath that I think I didn't, I wasn't expecting. And what it is, is, you know, we, <clears throat> kind of have a we almost almost always we, and and well certainly in lockdown it's been great we've been eating as a family together all the time right. but certainly certainly almost always we're, we're we're together on a friday evening and um and i usually like I'll, I'll light a candle and say a prayer and and um and and kind of welcome in this this time of sabbath but <clears throat> when we sit down it, it what i notice about that sabbath meal if I know in my mind that the next day I have nothing to do, like no agenda, no work, no emails to answer, you know, no articles to read or write or whatever it is, um, I am present, kind of physically and emotionally present in that moment in a way that even if we eat dinner together five days a week, it is there's something different. There's yeah. just something kind of kind of Quant, you know, qualitatively different about my presence with, you know, my family, my children, or if I meet up with, you know, meet up with some friends or a friend or whatever. Not that that's happening much these days <laughs> with lockdown, but, but you know, if it's on a Saturday and I meet up with a friend or do whatever, um, there is something I, I, I notice it, I, and and what that does to me is that I think I think what it's taught me over the years is that is is one how how kind of um, Oh, what's the word? How how flighty or how uh, how out of touch sometimes I am with those around me during my regular work week because I just get too consumed by work. Like I'm just yeah. not aware of the people around me, and so and so that's where I think you know the practice of Sabbath. You know, and 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 again, you know, I continue to stumble and fall every time I you know it's, I, I don't often have a really perfect <laughs> Sabbath. There's always something I do to mess it up, um, <clears throat> but. But I think that practice uh, in going through those, you know, kind of failures, what what does, you know, what does kind of, what does consecrated time mean? What does it mean to have a day of holy rest? So this is not just, and this is the other thing I try to explain to people. I'm like, I'm not just talking about a day off um, because anybody can take a day off. Um, what God commands is that we consecrate a seventh day as holy, you know, and, and so what does that mean when we kind of get into this idea of, okay, what is, what is holy time? And what does that look like in my life? Um, and I think that's something that, you know, just, you know, kind of even till today and year after year, I continue to wrestle with, you know, what what is a consecrated day really look like? Well, Dr. Mark Scarlatta, thank you very much for your wisdom and your guidance on this. <laughs> it's been great to be with you, Jerry. You've been listening to the Biblical Mind Podcast exploring the deep structures of Christian scripture. For more, visit the magazine at thebiblicalmind.org. Subscribe to this podcast at all the usual places so you never miss an episode.